What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and today we have a good one. It is finally August. It is redraft season. It is home league season. You guys are getting draft orders, setting up draft dates, and I want to make sure that you guys are as well equipped as possible to walk into these home leagues and absolutely dominate your friends. Now, this is going to be our first draft strategy video of this offseason. We are going to be doing one to two of these videos every single week to make sure you guys are ready to go and prepared for your home league drafts. Today, we are starting with the double hero RB draft strategy, a strategy that literally won millions of dollars in 2023. So we're going to talk about what's the definition of double hero RB, how to use it, how did it work in 2022, and then applying it for 2023 to go out there and dominate your draft. So with all that being said, if you enjoy this video at any point, make sure down below, subscribe, leave a like. Let's Go. Yes, stones like this froze. Wait, ice cold. Wait, oh, oh, wait, ice around my body like I'm froze on. Wait, she gonna let me. So, today we are talking through the double hero RB draft strategy and what is double hero RB. Now, this is gonna be called, I mean, I think some places are gonna call it double anchor RB, uh, by modal RB, but we're just gonna call it for simplicity's sake double hero RB. Now, the rough guidelines for how to use double hero RB is you take two running backs in the first three rounds and you don't take a third one until round seven at the absolute earliest. The goal is you draft too early and that's it. You hammer some you know, long shots and flyers late, but you're drafting too early and then you're making up ground at every other position and your goal should be to draft two running backs in the first three rounds and then that last bullet is that you want to have enough wide receivers to fill your flex spot so you know if you have three wide receivers in a flex spot you have wide receiver one wide receiver two wide receiver three wide receiver four and then plus another one or two by round 10 to make sure that you have wide receivers through the flex that can account for injuries and bye weeks and we'll kind of get into the idea of why we want that many wide receivers a little bit later but let's just sort of talk through the overarching idea of double hero rb and it stems from the idea that running back is king in fantasy and it is. Now, wide receiver and running backs can both hit 20-plus points per game at a similar rate. This is since 2010. You have 39 20-plus point per game RB seasons. You have 33 at wide receiver. That's about even, right? That's like, what, 33 divided by 39? It's probably like 85 to 90% competing with running backs. Now, we take it a step further, and we go to these. We've been talking through Pat Crane's legendary running back article the last few seasons. He has sort of coined the term legendary RB upside, which is what we're chasing. And these are your uh, Alvin Kamara in 2020, your Christian McCaffrey's, your Todd Gurley's, your David Johnson's, your Le'Veon Bell's, all of those massive, massive seasons. Those guys tend to have 22.5 plus points per game. Now, this is all in PPR, and we can see here running back has 17 to wide receiver 7 since 2010. So that's not, you know, close. So that's running back having pretty much more than double the amount wide receiver has had since 2010. So that's where you get your truly, truly difference-making upside at running back. That's when running back has the biggest advantage over wide receiver is when you are into that upper echelon of 22.5 plus point per game seasons. And when we take two running backs early, the goal is here that if wide receiver can keep pace with running back until we get to that 22.5 plus threshold, our two shots in a double hero RB build of taking those two running backs early, we want to take two massive swings at the running back one overall to truly get that difference making RB that tells us that that running back is a better pick than a wide receiver. So here's the question. Why take those swings early though, right? Like 22.5 plus points per game, presumably you could find that anywhere, right? So why does it have to be double hero RB? Why can't it just be take RBs wherever you please? Well, here's the thing. When we look back since 2010 and we sort out these 22.5 plus point per game seasons over every single round, we see these running backs that are putting up 22.5 plus points per game are only coming in the first three rounds. You have 13 in round one, three in round two, one in round three, where wide receivers are pretty top heavy, two in round one, three in round two, one in round five, which I believe is Cooper Cup, and then one in round 10 plus, which I believe is Odell Beckham's rookie year. So you can kind of ignore the wide receivers, but for running backs, all of those truly difference-making seasons are coming in the first three rounds. That's why we take too early and then we get the hell out of there. We don't need to you know, be chasing our dead zone running backs in those rounds four through six. And this is also why when we just sort of zoom out and we look at just 20 plus points per game. So this isn't 22.5. This is that 39 versus 33 that we're seeing in that chart on the left-hand side. This is dividing it up by rounds. So we have round one, round two, round three, rounds four through six, and then round seven plus. And when we zoom out, 
we can see 20 plus point per games at running back or 20 plus point per game seasons at running back are still pretty much condensed in those first three rounds after round three the running backs fall off a cliff where we only have one running back that has had a 20 plus point per game season in rounds four through six in 2010 and that was Fred Jackson in 2011 so since Fred Jackson in 2011 we have not had a 20 plus point per game running back in rounds four through six whereas we've had five 20 plus point per game seasons by wide receivers since then where we've had profiles in the past like Jamar Chase and Stephon Diggs and Cooper Cup and to a lesser extent you've even had guys like Jalen Waddle last year and Amon Ross St. Brown crushed in that area so these that that four through six area you really want to be prioritizing wide receiver which is why we don't chase the running backs into that area right we take our running backs early we shoot at that maximum upside, and then we have to make up ground everywhere else. And this is kind of the idea of the dead zone, right? This has been a, a topic that has been pretty hot the last few years. And when we look at advance rate from underdog leagues, now we're using underdog PPR leagues. It's half PPR best ball, which skews towards running backs. And on top of that, it's the only way to sort of aggregate thousands upon thousands of leagues and give us meaningful data with money on the line. Of course, you can do uh, sleeper queries and you can do like ESPN data but at the same time a lot of those are free home leagues that collapse or have kids on those sites at least on underdog it is 21 plus in most areas 18 plus in most areas and there is real money on the line to sort of pull data from now of course asterisk is that it's best ball but we can sort of take the core principles and apply it to our home leagues and we can see here your advance rate above and below expectation this is from 2021 and 2022 so two years of data we can see that taking running back in that round four through six area is not great. Like that is the red across the board, those negative advance rates. And then you get to round seven plus, and that's the green zone. That's where you want to be firing off your shots. That was Josh Jacobs last year. That was Ramondre Stevenson last year, Tony Pollard last year. Uh, he wasn't amazing, amazing, but Clyde edwards was in that range last year. That's where you want to be taking more swings on running backs, not in that round four through six area. Now, you guys might be looking at this chart, though, and thinking to yourself, well, Ron, what about the early running backs? We're, we're, we're taking two running backs in the first three rounds, and even this chart is saying that outside of like team four and five in round three, running backs that early have been bad. And that's kind of the downside of the strategy. When we sort of talk about the shortcomings of the strategy, double hero RB, it's very boom bust. Running backs as a whole have not been great picks in the first two rounds or first three rounds the last couple of years. And it's really just because of the nature of of the running back position running backs are going to bust at a higher rate due to injury and age decline that's again why we're sort of pushing hammering that home the pat crane idea of if you're drafting a running back early he has to have that differentiating upside from wide receivers at 22.5 plus points per game or he has to be the rb1 overall and gap the rest of the running backs though again when you're taking those two running backs early you have to keep that in mind you have to draft a running back not because of his floor because no running back has floor you have to be drafting them for their ceiling to get an advantage over the other running backs and get an advantage over the other wide receivers. Now, this is backed up by data. This is a great article that is an oldie but a goodie. It took into account 2009 through 2015 data. Josh Hermsmeyer over on Rotoviz did a uh, really cool study where he looked at the injury rate of wide receivers versus running back in terms of serious injuries. So these are like season ending injuries like ACL tears and those really brutal ones. And as you can see, top 24 ADP wide receivers and top 24 ADP running backs, running backs are getting hurt in a serious way on average 45.36% of the time versus wide receivers at 18.3% of the time. That's about 2.5 times more likely to suffer a really catastrophic injury. So that is kind of the catch 22 here. It's that running backs get hurt at a really high rate. They bust at a really high rate. The idea of the strategy is we're taking two swings. We're sort of, you know, sifting through that red sea there in rounds one through three because we know on the other side we at least know that hidden within the red sea rounds one through three you have those truly difference making running back seasons right 13 in round one uh three in round two one in round three that's what we're chasing there the thing is that the reason we don't chase them rounds four through six is because they're gone by then even the 20 plus point per game guys like we showed earlier are gone by then right rounds four through six just been fred jackson so that's kind of the idea here you're taking two shots early you really want to have two shots at the rb1 overall because those guys give you the most sort of like win rate and wins over replacement among any other position or any other player they are the highest upside so you're going to take two shots early on that guy and then get out of there you don't want to be drafting running backs in that rounds four through six area now when we talk about kind of the results from last year and how this strategy did we can see that Karain last year 
in Best Ball Mania on underdog. He took two shots at running back, Eckler and Saquon Barkley, and he won $2 million because of this because he took two shots and one of them ended up being the RB1 overall in fantasy. That's the whole idea of the strategy. You take two shots and you hope one of them is the RB1 overall as that true league winning running back in fantasy. And Kareem here went Eckler uh, at the 110. He came back around, took Saquon. Eckler at the 10 spot ended up being the RB1 overall in fantasy. Saquon ended up being like a top five running back. And the downside of this strategy is real. But if you have a draft like this where you get the RB1 overall and then stack a top five running back on top of that, and you can start both of those guys on a weekly basis, then you're probably going to crush your league. Now, the thing to really take into account here is what he does after those two running backs. Of course, they both crush, but you can see he didn't have a perfect draft, right? He had DJ Moore in the third round, who really wasn't that great last year, but it's important that you draft as if those two running backs crush, right? You should be drafting this league or this team in double hero RB as if your top two running backs, one of them is the RB1 overall, and the other one is a top five producer at the position, because once you start chasing the running backs into the middle rounds, again, you are you want to be drafting not to lose. So if you start drafting running backs in the middle round, which we just talked about why that's a bad idea, because you're like, okay, well, what if my Eckler gets hurt? Well, if you start drafting as if Eckler gets hurt, then you are handcuffing yourself to an outcome. Like if you are drafting for the outcome where your team doesn't work out, then you, you're completely cutting off your upside. You're taking on risk because you're scared that one of your running backs are going to get hurt. And you start to build teams that are handcuffed and have, you know, high floors, low ceilings. And even in a league of 12 people, one divided by 12, that's like a 92nd percentile outcome that you still need for your team. You still should be shooting for that upside. So what he did here is he didn't take another running back until Ramondre Stevenson in round 10. He took nothing but non-running backs from rounds three through nine. And that's really, really important. You should be using those picks to make up ground at your other positions. You are at a huge disadvantage in those spots. If you take two running backs early, you are behind that quarterback, tight end, and most importantly, wide receiver so your next five to six picks after those two running backs early should be to make up ground everywhere else and you can see here kareen fills he almost goes overkill underdog is three wide receiver one flex so he drafts dj morris as wide receiver one waddle is his wide receiver two he takes kittle as an elite tight end which is a, a solid play Chris godwin's now his wide receiver three hunter renfro is his uh, flex spot tom brady's his quarterback and then tyler lockett is a bench piece and that's really important you want to be drafting through your flex and then some additional pieces. What we talked about earlier when I talked about the guidelines, through 10 rounds, you want enough wide receivers to fill your flex position. So if it's two wide receivers, one flex, that's three wide receivers. If it's two wide receivers, two flex, that's four. If it's three wide receivers, one flex, four again. You want to have all of those spots filled and then another one or two on top just to make up four bye weeks and injuries. Because when you're investing less draft capital in those positions, you don't have to draft as if all of those wide receivers smash, right? Because you're not spending first and second round draft capital on wide receivers or super high draft capital in general on wide receivers, you have a little bit more leeway to kind of expect some of them not to hit. You're not going to hit on your round on every single one of those like four picks from rounds like, you know, three through seven, right? So the idea here is we want wide receivers in the flex. We want more wide receivers than we might need. And we have the win the flex tool on Rotoviz that sort of shows us that after those first three rounds, right, the top 36, this is in, this is using PPR settings, uh, and three wide receiver, one flex spot here, we can see that wide receivers project for more than running backs after the first three rounds, right? You have like pick 25 across the bottom. Then once you get to like that 30, 35 area, things switch back to wide receivers. So in a perfect world, you want wide receivers in that area. You want enough to fill the flex plus a couple more, and you want wide receivers to be in your flex spot. Now, it is important to note that after the top 100 picks, things shift back to running back because you want those handcuff profiles that can pop up out of nowhere. You know, your Jeff Wilson's last year, your Jarek McKinnon's, uh, your Khalil Herbert's and all of that. But when we're talking about filling the flex in the draft through your first 10 rounds, we want wide receivers in that spot. And we want more wide receivers than we possibly need because, again, things do go wrong and you can't replicate that production off of waivers, right? If a running back goes down, you can get a handcuff. You can find the guy off waivers, put him in there. Voila. Wide receiver is not the same, you know, deal. Where if Calvin really was to go down, Zay Jones isn't all of a sudden a wide receiver one on the week. But in years past, Dalvin Cook goes down, Alvin Madison's a, wide, a running back one in that given week. Now, this team by Pat is an absolute beauty. This is how I want my double hero RBs to look, or my double hero RB teams to look. You can see here, Eckler, Saquon, he goes... Uh, like five wide receivers through the first 10. Then he goes Ramondre, which is just a beautiful pick. Goes back to the wide receiver well on Jacoby Myers. He takes another stab at quarterback, another tight end there. Wandale Robinson. He doesn't take another running back after Ramondre until Raheem Mostert. 
and Sony Michelle in the 16th and 17th round. Once you take those two guys up top, in standard like home leagues where you know you only have so many bench spots, you can end up with like four to five running backs and be just fine. You can even end up with like three to four running backs if you want and get really skinny there. So to summarize here, just the strategy as a whole, RBs are generally bad picks early because they bust at a high rate and wide receivers can match their production in that 20 plus point per game area. Running backs only become good picks early on when you hit on the RB1 overall or you hit on one of those 22.5 plus point per game ceilings where they're now outproducing every other position. Those running backs historically are found in the first three rounds. So in double hero RB, you're taking two shots on the RB1 overall in rounds one through three, and then you're getting the hell out of there until at the very least round seven. Now, a lot of you guys are going to ask, where can I use this strategy? Can I use this in my league? My league is this. You can use double hero RB. The beauty of double hero RB it's the most universal draft strategy. You can use it in every single league. You can use it, I cannot stress enough, 14-teamer. You can use it standard league. You can use it PPR. You can use it tight end premium. You can use it. Anything you can use it. Two running backs, five wide receivers in a flex spot. You can use double hero RB. You can use it across the board, every single league. I would say the less wide receiver and flex spots, the better for double hero RB. And it's very beginner friendly, which is nice. So, how are we going to apply this to redraft managers in 2023? Because we don't just want to look at Pat's team and then try to replicate it. That's not really how things work, right? Every single year is a different environment. And I do believe that Double Hero RB this year is set up to crush now more than ever. Of course, we've seen it at like the big best ball tournaments, but in home leagues, I think it's really set up to crush here because, you know, Double Hero RB last year, of course, it crushed for Pat Corain. But it wasn't the most dominant strategy on average. Like it, on average, it was a bad strategy. It just has a ton of upside where if you actually hit on those two running backs, right? Like let's say you got, uh, you know, like Eckler, Chubb, Saquon, McCaffrey, and you, you paired, you know, two of those guys together, you did well. But on the other hand, you had Jonathan Taylor who busted, Dalvin Cook, Najee Harris, DeAndre Swift, Javante Williams. A lot of guys busted last year, and zero RB was actually the best strategy. But I think it's foolish to go into this year thinking that zero RB is going to repeat again because that's just not how things work. And what it did last year of all these running backs busting and guys like Justin Jefferson being league winners is it caused a massive, massive shift in current ADP. Where this is current ADP on NFFC. This is high stakes, $350 leagues. Mostly boomers are on this site. Old guys playing like NFFC. Most of you guys haven't heard of this site, but it's high stakes. All the guys are really old on there. And it's crazy. This is the first time I can rem remember four wide receivers being in the top five of ADP with eight wide receivers total in the first round. Now, the whole point of something like zero RB, which I have talked about in the past, I love, I've loved zero RB. I'm kind of, I'm not really doing it a ton this year though, because the whole point of zero RB is to take an elite wide receiver in like the late first round while your league mates are chasing, you know, RB9, RB10, RB11, and just taking a running back to take a running back. And in years past, you know, you would have McCaffrey or Gurley at 101. And then let's say you had a guy at like the ninth overall pick taking the RB9 off the board, pretty much just making a worse version of those McCaffrey Gurley teams, right? So the, the whole idea there was to zig when others zag, right? If everyone's just going to chase running back production to try and compete with your McCaffreys and Gurleys, why not get an elite wide receiver and then come back around and get another elite wide receiver? So instead of having like the RB9 and like the RB13, you could have the wide receiver one and like the wide receiver three and have a massive advantage. Well, now that's completely flipped. The elite wide receivers are gone in the first five picks. And you are now in a spot in the late first where you are having to do the same thing, right? Like your AJ Brown 12 spot is just making a shittier version of that Justin Jefferson team. So instead of doing that, I kind of want to zig while others zag this year, where if we sort of look back, I was looking back through ADP. We had one year that looked almost exactly like this. Uh, this is high stakes ADP from FFPC in 2016. So there's only nine leagues of data here, but this is 2016. So we are talking again, like really old players, guys who are taking running backs all the time. 2016, we had an interesting spot here where if we look at the 22.5 plus point per game seasons by position year over year, 2012 through 2015 is a spot that reminds me a lot of this spot we're in right now of 2019 through 2022, right? So 2015, you had two wide receivers at 22.5 plus points per game and then no running backs. And then 2016 happened, and this is the ADP we got. Four wide receivers in the, in the first five picks, uh, I believe like seven total here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven total. And then in 2016, 
it proved that the market overcorrected because we had no wide receivers that produced 22.5 plus points per game, and we had two running backs there. Now we have something similar here, where in 2022, we have no running backs that produce 22.5 plus points per game. We have over this entire span, we have three running backs and three wide receivers that hit 22.5 plus points per game. Same thing that happened over 2012 to 2015, but that was, I believe it was two running backs versus four wide receivers. So about the same there. And then now we are seeing 2022, which looks a lot like the ADP from 2015 or 2016. And then we see what happened in 2016 is things overcorrected and we got two legendary running back seasons that year. I think that's what we see here. And it's something we can learn from this season. I think the pendulum is going to swing back. This is a bit of an overreaction from a down year at running back last year. And what that, you know, sort of gives me the inclination to do is now instead of, you know, starting my draft with like the wide receiver one and the wide receiver three, that's no longer possible, right? Because the wide receiver one is going at the 101, where in years past, you could maybe get that guy at like the 108. But what you can do this year is you can now sort of zag when everyone else is zigging and you can take a running back at like the nine spot. You can take like the RB3 off the board, come back around and take like another top six running back. You can start your, you can start your draft with like the RB2 and like the RB6 off the board, which I think is a really nice way to start your draft. Double hero RB while everybody's soaking up all the wide receivers this year. And you can get a massive advantage at running back. And that's what I did from the eight spot in our first high stakes draft this year that we did live on NFFC, which I think is a, a really solid strategy where we took Bijan Robinson at the eight spot. And then we came back around. Bijan Robinson was the RB2 off the board. And then we came back around and grabbed Nick Chubb, the RB5 off the board. So we started on a site that's $350 with a lot of old heads on there. We started with two top five running backs. I cannot name you another time when that was ever possible. In most years, top five running backs, like there's going to be five running backs in the first round. 90% of the time. This is a year where the environment is very weird, and I think it lends itself to double hero RB in this way, where if you get to a spot now where you know your elite wide receivers are off the board in like Chase, Jefferson, uh, Tyree Kill, Cup, and Kelsey's off the board, I'm taking one of Bijan Eckler, and then I'm coming back around, and I'm taking one of Chubb, Pollard, JT, Saquon Barkley, and starting my draft that way. Now, in terms of the format of this draft, $350 high stakes managed league. This is not best ball. This is a managed league. You do waivers. You cannot make trades in this league, though. Um, and this is the format where we have uh, one quarterback, six point passing TD, two running backs, three wide receivers, a tight end, a flex spot, a kicker, a defense, 10 bench spots. And after starting the, with those two running backs here, I will say we, we went Chubb in the second. Uh, this was a couple weeks ago. So this was during like Saquon's like holdout risk. And like this wasn't during JT's risk or whatever. So that's why the uh, prices are a little bit wrong. But I think it's still worth sort of looking through and seeing kind of what we did from here. Now, it's also a third round reversal. So keep that in mind, right? So it goes like one, two, and then 301 starts from the 12th spot, and then it just snakes from there. So don't be alarmed. Third round reversal is something that they just do on this site. It's really not a big deal. I promise it's not a big deal. So the third round pick comes around, and this is where we want to start making up ground at our other spots. We started with two top five running backs. We're feeling really good there, but now we need to make up ground elsewhere. Now, I will say we got sniped here on Devonta Smith just before Debo went, and we got sniped uh, on T. Higgins. Those were the last two wide receivers in a tier for me. Uh, so then I could have either gone Mark Andrews here, but I didn't want to go three rounds without a wide receiver. It's still really important to get your wide receiver production in in a full PPR. And then I could have also gone Debo or Ridley. Those were my next two best wide receivers, but those are guys I'd rather pick at like the 3-4 turn instead of like, you know, what do we take him here, like the 305? So yeah, 305, Debo doesn't feel great, but I took Debo. I love him a lot, but that's not the price that I want to pay. But we take him. I'm fine with him as my wide receiver one. We come back around to this four spot. And I will say I would have loved uh, Keenan Allen here. I would have loved Christian Watson. I would have loved Drake London. They all went. You could have made the case to take Brees Hall or Travis Etienne here. And that's kind of the downside of double here RB is you cut yourself off from being able to sort of scoop up running back value late. Uh, I think it's viable. You could take a third running back, right? If, if you wanted to take Brees Hall or Travis Etienne, I think you could have there. But then those Zach Charbonnet and Kendra Miller picks in like the 10th and 12th round, you could do without those. If I go three running backs in the first, right, if, if we chase a running back into round four. Now, I will say Brees Hall and Etienne to me are more like third rounders and fourth rounders. So, of course, like the thing with these, with these draft strategies is don't take them for the law. We want to be flexible in draft rooms. We don't want to sort of force draft strategies down our throats. We want to be flexible. You could have taken Brees Hall here. You could have taken Travis Etienne. But what I will say is I wouldn't have taken Charbonnet. I wouldn't have taken Kendra Miller. And then I probably would just take that Josh Kelly at the end and call that a day. But instead here, we go DJ Moore, who doesn't feel great. Uh, but in like full PPR is like a fourth round. He was like the last wide receiver in a tier for me. It was between him and Mike Williams. 
Uh, we didn't know at the time that we were going to take Justin Herbert in the fifth. Knowing what we know now, I wish I took Mike Williams for the stack. But we come back around. He wi- th- This room wipes out my wide receiver tier. I'm not taking Deontay Johnson in the fifth round. I'm not taking, uh, I'm not taking Christian Kirk in the fifth round. So we take Justin Herbert uh, unstacked. But it is a six-point passing TD league where if like Burrow is a fourth, then I think Herbert in the fifth uh, is a really, really nice value. So then from round six through nine, and we'll take this off so you guys can see the rest of the picks. From round six through nine, it's time to hammer wide receivers. So we get JSN, who is our wide receiver three, in quotes. Michael Pittman goes into our flex. And then we go Quentin Johnston to stack to Herbert. And then we go Michael Thomas. So through nine rounds, we have two top five running backs, an elite quarterback, wide receivers through our three wide receiver spots, flex spot, and then two off the bench, which is perfect. That is exactly how I want to be. We have a nice balanced approach. We're punting tight end, but you kind of have to punt one of the onesies when you do a double hero RB build. And this looks really good. I, I also love the fact that like Debo Samuel, DJ Moore, Pittman, Michael Thomas can be our four wide receiver starters in week one. And we can kind of let the rookies develop in JSN and Quentin Johnston down the stretch and be our late season hammers. You really want rookie wide receivers in these double hero RB builds as well because you want to hit on next year's, you know, Christian Watson or Amon Ross St. Brown, these wide receivers who come alive down the stretch of a season. That's kind of how you make up for not taking a wide receiver early in these builds. Now, from this point, we have fully made up ground on wide receiver. Again, through the flex, plus two more. So we can sort of just take a balanced approach to the rest of the draft. We take Charbonnet and Kendrick Miller, two rookie running backs that can sort of be late hammers for us. I, we don't, you don't need like a Samaj P. Ryan and a double hero RB build. In a perfect world, you're betting on those two running backs to at least give you, you know, six weeks of production before getting hurt or any, or bye weeks come around. And then you can have those late season guys that can come alive for you and even be like flex plays or something in Kendrick Miller and Charbonnet. We threw three do- darts at tight end here. Dolchich, Everett to stack to Herbert, Komet, uh, we went Hyatt and Josh Palmer. Hyatt's a nice, like another rookie wide receiver profile. Palmer stacks to Herbert. So if like Keenan Allen or Michael Williams go down, we can put Josh Palmer in the lineup. And if he, you know, catches a touchdown, we get, you know, the benefactor of Josh Palmer in our flex. And then also Herbert as our QB. Take Russell Wilson, backup QB. We take a defense kicker. And then Josh Kelly is like a, a handcuff flyer that like if the Chargers, we're making a bet on this Chargers offense. So why, might as well get the handcuff, right? If this Chargers offense is amazing. Also, if Eckler goes down, that boosts the passing offense. So you just get some like mini correlations going on there. Now, I also want to show you guys one more draft uh, where we did it from the early spot. I think there's two spots that Double Hero RB works really well. First of them being this draft here, where we could take like an Eckler Bijan at the end of the first. If not, though, I think the play is to do it from early on when you take one of those elite wide receivers. So we did this here. Now, this is the same format. One quarterback, uh, one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, a tight end, a flex spot, kicker defense. We took out kicker defense, and then we had a bunch of bench spots. Uh, But in terms of starting lineups, the same thing, full PPR. We go chase at the 102. And again, I think this is where things perfectly line up for double hero being on the other side, where you're taking one of the elite wide receivers, and then instead of making a zero RB team that can kind of compete with like your Devontae Adams, Amon Ross, St. Brown teams on the other side of the board, why not double up on two running backs from this side? So we take elite wide receiver one in Jamar Chase. We come back around and we take the two running backs that are sliding right now uh, due to holdout risk and Jonathan Taylor and Josh Jacobs. As we know, running backs are super risky bets anyways. I'm not going to let uh, holdout risk or really extend things any further like as of right now i'm fine taking jt in the in the late second i'm fine taking jacobs in the, in the early third i will say i would have been fine instead of jacobs with like a ramondre there uh as well you could also talk me into even like Brees hall that early now after that it's time to make up ground we go to the four five turn we go amari cooper and jerry judy i will say there were a bunch of wide receivers i liked in this range you could have gone amari you could have gone uh judy london uh christian watson dj moore they would all work and then the six seven turns where it got tough uh i like deontay johnson uh he's somebody we just talked about i wouldn't take in the fifth but six eleven i'm taking deontay johnson there in full ppr jsn was also very interesting here uh and then trevor lawrence we end up deciding to go deontay johnson because we're still drafting players that were starting in week one, right? Deontay Johnson is going in the flex starting week one. And then in a QB hungry mock draft like this on sleeper, I was fine kind of the bull- biting the bullet and going seventh round Trevor Lawrence, pushing him past the turn because he already had Josh Allen. Uh, and I think that that's a decent start. Now, we come back around at the 8-9 turn. Onesies are flying off the board in these drafts. So I decided, let's stack up Lawrence. 
with Evan Ingram in the late eighth. I will say I probably prefer Ingram as like a ninth, but we took him in the late eighth here. It doesn't feel great, but we also now sort of free ourselves up. We don't have to spend dra uh, bench spots on two quarterbacks or two tight ends. We can just spend them all on wide receivers and like running back handcuff flyers. Now I will say next week, we're going to make a video outlining why stacking is essential, even in homies. I think some of you guys would be like, Ron, like Trevor Lawrence and Evan Ingram there. You don't have to stack. Like, I think you're taking stacking too seriously. I'm going to make a video. I promise stacking is a good play, especially here with onesies, where if you draft Trevor Lawrence, you're betting on the on the Jaguars offense to be really good this year. So why not get some pieces that would benefit from that, right? So we get Evan Ingram in the event that Trevor Lawrence is really good and this offense is good. Evan Ingram probably pays off. And we're talking through tight ends. Like, if I was going to take in Joker or Evan Ingram, why not just take Evan Ingram there? Now, after that, we take Quentin Johnson in the ninth round, which is just absurd value. We'll probably make a video eventually, but rookie wide receivers on Sleeper and just like ESPN Yahoo, ridiculous, right? We took Quentin Johnson like the seventh round uh, in that other draft. We get him in the ninth round here. 10-11 comes around. I will say at this point in the draft, we have wide receivers through the flex plus one is Quentin Johnson. I would like another one through 10 rounds. Uh, it ends up being Sky Moore, which isn't super, super sexy. Uh, I was really hoping for Bateman and Elijah Moore to get to us, but they didn't. But it's kind of just the push and pull of this, right? Like we sort of sacrificed some wide receiver firepower to take our two running backs early and then also take Trevor Lawrence and Evan Ingram. Like we didn't choose to punt off one of the onesies. So that means if we're not taking onesies late, we're hammering more shots on wide receiver. Where the last one we had so many wide receivers through eight rounds that I felt comfortable, uh, or through nine rounds that I felt comfortable not taking another one until like round 16. And this one was a little bit different. We took Nico Collins, so another upside shot at wide receiver. And then we also took Zay Jones as a nice little, you know, stacking piece to Lawrence where I don't love Zay Jones, but if I start him in my lineup and he catches a touchdown, again, you get that dual impact of Zay Jones gets points, Trevor Lawrence gets points. Um, and then we took two depth pieces in Kendra Miller, who's fun. I think we got an official Alvin Kamara suspension today. Uh, and then Leonard Fournette, where Fournette could sign somewhere and boost an ADP. And if he doesn't, you can cut him before week one. So that's how I would play it, right? We're not taking too, too many uh, running backs here. If we take too early, we're ending up with like four to five total. We're worrying about wide receiver, filling things through the flex, getting enough wide receivers through 10 rounds. But that is double hero RB. And just to brush up on it one last time, uh, we will show the, I think I have the, yeah, this is it. Again, two running backs in the first three rounds. You're not taking your third running back until round seven at the absolute earliest. And then your goal should be to have enough wide receivers through your flex plus another one or two by round 10. And you'll be good to go with the double hero RB draft strategy. Now, of course, we just updated the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. I have my top 200 rankings out for fantasy football, for home leagues, for redraft, managed leagues, all of that good stuff. It's PPR, it's half PPR. And I have it set up right now where I have every single player, top 200, tiered. And in those tiers, I have their target draft value. So like what round or, or what round am I sort of hoping to draft these players? At what point does it feel good to draft these players? So I have your target rounds. I have them tiered. And I have it set up in a way where I have it so it'll lead you down these draft strategies where I'm prioritizing wide receivers in the dead zone. I'm pushing up those like Tony Pollards and JTs and Chubbs to the early second so you can kind of get those like Bijan wraparound double hero RB builds. Same thing with the one that we talked about with Jamar Chase where I have, uh, you know, your Jacobs and your Ramondres even pushed up a little bit. But then once those profiles are gone and we get to like round four through seven, we're prioritizing wide receiver. And then once we get to that green zone we talked about where round seven through 10 is just a green zone for running backs or pushing the running backs back up. So as much as my running back or as much as my rankings are, player A versus player B, they're also structurally geared to sort of put you down the path of optimal drafting. So that is patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. You can find it in the description. You can find it in the comment section down below. You get not only my fantasy football rankings for 2023, I'm going to help guide you this season. We're going to go, go through, I'm going to have in-season weekly rankings, right? So if you have flex spots and all of that, I'll have you covered there. And if they're not covered in the weekly rankings, I have a start sit stream we do every Sunday just for the patrons to help you get all of your start sit decisions together. Uh, I have a weekly waiver wire report where, where I talk through my favorite waiver wire ads and how much of my fab budget I would spend on each of those players. We have subscriber leagues. We have one-on-one -on -one advice. In season, after week one, we'll have rest of season rankings, right? So you can make trades out there and sort of gauge off of that. Tons and tons and tons of value on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. But if you can't support there, likes and subscribes help the boy out a ton hope you guys enjoyed first of many strategy videos to come this august we should have a like hero rb or zero rb coming out within the next seven days let's say so be excited for that stay tuned and as always i love you guys and i will see y'all in the next one
DVS stones, uh, like this froze, uh, ice cold, uh, oh, oh.